the genesis of this program was the generosity of the McAllister Tugboat Company. <laughs> and, my, and my lovely wife, who somehow convinced the McAllister people to give me a ride on the tugboat last year, my birthday. And because of that, and because I know a lot of you guys have talked to me about it, we are, we're really interested in how Hampton Roads operates. We spent a lot of time out there dodging tugboats and trying to stay out of the way of big ships. Uh, so, so we have three presenters this morning who have generously given their time to come in on a Saturday morning and talk to us about about how a slice of how Hampton Roads works. Sarah McCoy is going to be our first presenter. She's going to give us the overview of the operation of the port of, uh, of uh, New, uh, Norfolk and kind of set us into the context about how the other presenters operate. Then we're going to have Bob Clinton stand up and talk about McAllister Tugs and about tugboat operations in general, how he got to work in tugboats, how tugboats operate, what we should think about tugboats when we're out there, monitor channel 13, right? And then Captain George Watkins is going to stand up and talk about 40 years of being a Chesapeake Bay pilot. Each one, each one has certain strengths uh, that they bring to this presentation. I'll ask them to talk just a little bit about their background before they, as they start the presentation. They'll talk for 40 minutes. There'll be a break while we get the media changed. Everybody gets a cup of coffee, and then we'll start again. Any questions for me? Sarah, you're on. Uh, may I suggest oh, one minute, if you have an electronic device, um, mute it or put it on stun or something? I've asked to ask the three of you if you mind if we take your presentation, because we'll put it on our club website and so people can who are here. And you'll get, I'll get the royalties, right? Absolutely. A free cup of coffee. Perfect. And if Thank Tim you. will operate the machinery for me, I think we're straight. You're on. Thank you, Tim. I'll just kind of point. Okay. Thank you all for having me. Again, uh, my name is Sarah McCoy. I work for the Port of Virginia. I moved to Virginia in 2008. I grew up in Texas. So you might hear my accent come out from time to time, but it's really been watered down, and I've been practicing this Tidewater accent that Captain George does so well. So, um, <laughs> I really appreciate that, but I uh, today I just want to give you an overview of the Port of Virginia. If you were like me, I uh, was here for several years. I even worked at the Norfolk Yacht Club as a lifeguard in between classes and would look over at the cranes at Norfolk International Terminal. And it never dawned on me for one second that probably everything I was touching, wearing, much of what I was eating had probably come through the waterways that I was monitoring. So. Uh, I just hope that this presentation gives you a little bit more background. I like it to be a dialogue. I don't mind questions throughout, so please just stop me if anything perks your interest. But with that, Tim, could you go and just show us what we're going to talk about today? Again, intro to the Port of Virginia. We'll talk about our finances because uh, all of you businessmen and women know that uh, that's where the rubber meets the road and how you steward your finances. We'll talk about the port's economic impact and then where we're going um, forward. So, so when I say Port of Virginia, um, a lot of you, uh, and even our host Bob did it today, Port of Norfolk, uh, Port of Hampton Roads, you hear all of these different words. Well, when I say Port of Virginia, I'm talking about three legal entities. That would be the Virginia Port Authority. That is the state agency, the political subdivision that reports to the Secretary of Transportation and then ultimately to the governor. So they are the, the entity that owns and oversees operations at the Port of Virginia. The second company or entity is Virginia International Terminals. That is an LLC. It's a, it's a private operating company, and they're the ones who do the contracts with the ship lines, the labor. They're the ones who do the physical work or oversee the physical work on, on each of our marine terminals. And then this acronym, HRCP2, that stands for Hampton Roads Chassis Pool. We'll talk about chassis later on in this presentation. But when I say Port of Virginia, those, these are the three companies that are under that branding umbrella. So when 
if you're like me, you think Port, oh, of course, Hampton Roads, we're all right there. But the Port of Virginia has a slightly larger footprint. Uh, we do have four marine terminals right here on our waterway. We also just got a 40-year lease uh, at the Port of Richmond. This is a facility right on the James River, uh, just south of the downtown area in Richmond. And then last but not least, we have the Virginia Inland Port. And no, there are no vessels trans <laughs> going up the Shenandoah River. Um, this facility is serviced by rail. This is actually interesting. I found it interesting anyway because this was somebody's brainchild back in the 1980s, and everybody thought they were crazy. What What are you talking about, an inland port? But what was happening is Captain George and Mr. Clinton can probably tell you the Port of Baltimore was kicking Virginia's tail as it related to volume. They had the, the million consumers in D.C. right in their backyard, and so they were able to uh, feed those consumers. And here in Virginia, we didn't have that dense population so close. So this person, and I really don't know who to attribute it to, maybe you can tell me, but um, they said, let's put an inland facility right at the crosshairs of Highway 81 and 66, two main freight uh, transportation routes uh, through Virginia. So over time, this has been quite a success because now, not only do we now kick Baltimore sale in volume, but this facility has spawned significant economic development. There's about 39 to 40 different manufacturing and distribution centers in this region, and our study showed that there's over 8,000 jobs in this region that are directly related to the international freight moving in and out of this facility. So, next slide. So what you're looking at here is the bird's eye view of our harbor. We are just uh, see the words NIT, or just to the right of that to give you some orientation there. But just moving around this harbor, Norfolk International Terminal, that's our oldest and largest facility. This is owned and operated by the Port of Virginia. This was an old Army uh, depot during World War One and Two, and then it was transferred to the state many years after that. Uh, it does almost primarily containerized cargo, so those are the big boxes that you see stacked up on the ships that you're watching come in and out of your waterway. And uh, as we head down south, you're looking at Portsmouth Marine Terminal. This is right when you come out of the Midtown Tunnel on Highway 164. And many of you might have noticed that for years, like probably the last five years, this facility was dormant and you didn't see a lot of activity there. That's because VIG, Virginia International Gateway, is a brand new, state-of-the-art, almost fully automated facility. This means that they don't have men and women like you and I moving the cargo. They have robotic cranes moving the cargo. And so uh, when that facility came online in 2008, PMT was shuttered because now we have space and, and technology and, uh, to move the cargo. So as our cargo volumes increased across the port, we had to bring PMT back online in 2015. Um, and so now when you go, it's bustling and we have plans to keep it open because the cargo volume demands necessitate the need for PMT. Virginia International Gateway um, is pretty unique because we lease this facility. The owners of this facility originally were a little known company you probably never heard of, AP Muller Mares. <laughs> but they were the ones who had the foresight. They said, where are we gonna put our next state-of-the-art terminal? They can put it anywhere in the globe. They have a footprint throughout the world. But they chose your harbor. They chose your harbor because it's deep, it's quick to the ocean, open ocean. And so uh, they developed this facility and it came online, if you recall, I said in 2007. Well, what happened in 2008? We tanked, right. And so that's when the state came in and said, hey, we'll take it for you, we'll lease it. We have the uh, contracts with the ship lines, let us help you. And so um, as a result, we're still there. AP Muller Maersk has now sold it to an investment fund called the Alinda Group, which is a really good thing for us because now our landlords are desk jockeys is what I like to say because they, could, they can't breach the contract and operate this port whereas AP Muller Maersk, they're expert port operators. So it's a really good symbiotic relationship and we'll talk more about it when, when 
you look up there in that yellow box around the water, future home of Craney Island Marine Terminal. So we'll talk more about this, and I hope Captain George and uh, Mr. Clinton, who drive by this on a routine basis, will follow up. But this is where we see future development. This will ultimately be built from the dredging soil, so all of that sediment that we bring up will create a brand new marine terminal. I'll touch on that a little bit later. But then last but not least, uh, Newport News Marine Terminal. What's unique about Newport News is it does not handle containerized cargo. It handles anything that doesn't fit in a container. So we call this break bulk or row row. Does anyone know what I mean when I say row row? Roll on, roll on. This is great. This is good. <laughs> Still military on Yes, yes, good. Good. And so um, here we have contracts with companies like Chrysler, Fiat, um, Infinity, Nissan, and we do some Caterpillar equipment, like heavy machinery there. So, Tim, I think we've seen our harbor. Let's get moving to fiscal year 15. We had about a 9% growth rate over uh, 2014. This is <coughs> predicted to continue when we forecast uh, growth in volume. Uh, we're looking at about a, anywhere from conservative estimates are 4.2%. Uh, to 7% growth year over year uh, for the foreseeable future with this current trade climate and that sort of thing. But what you're seeing broken down is how we increase the, our moves by rail, 4.2% over last year, 5.9% increase in the number of vessel calls, and we'll talk more about why that's important, 12% increase in the amount of cargo moved by truck, and then 10.9%, so almost 11% moved by barge. Yeah, and that is important when it comes to finances. So what you're looking at here, the consolidated operating income over the last few years, you can see it's a steady increase and, and that's all great. But if you'll go to the next slide, what does that really mean? <laughs> well, we we had we were making money, but when it compared to our expenses, we were not we were not being good stewards of our finances. That meant when we are in the red these years. That means we're not investing in our infrastructure and keeping pace with this growth. And so in 2014, uh, we really worked hard to capture some efficiencies, kind of restructure, rebrand, <coughs> unify, just make sure we're all going in the same direction. And that really has paid off, it literally paid off. And so this 14.2 uh, million can go back into your port, go back <coughs> into developing your port buying better state-of-the-art cranes, increasing our safety, increasing our capacity. So uh, that's our plan. I hope to see this trend continue. Invite me back next year and uh, keep us accountable. So next slide. But um, you saw where we talked about the different modes of transportation and how volume had increased over in fiscal year 15. But what this is showing you is as a port, we have to not just think about what happens inside of our gate. We've got to consider that first mile to get the cargo there and the last mile to get it out. I think I said it backwards, Captain George. But it, um, it's important that we are communicating with our regional transportation partners because we can't just flood the, the roadways with cargo. I don't know if you're like me, I understand all about this movement of freight and how important it is, but I still hate it when I'm boxed in by massive 18 wheelers in a tunnel. So we have to look for other ways to move this cargo. So we have, we move about 4% of all of our cargo by barge. Truck is still the most because that's probably the most cost competitive. Trucking is the most cost competitive if you're in a 200 uh, to 300 mile radius from, from your port. After that, rail is, is more competitive and we move about 33% of all of our cargo by rail. We're actually, uh, we have moved more cargo by rail than any other port on the East Coast. So this is a pretty, pretty big um, rail market because what we're doing is we are the funnel for uh, the bread basket is what I like to call it. Think of all of those ag products in the Midwest. Well, how are they getting out? And how are we getting them exported to Europe and Asia and South America? We want to we want to be your port that you're funneling all of those goods out, and so that's where we really excel in our rail markets. 
And so when we talk about ag products or <coughs> commodities in general, this is a breakdown for you all of what our top 10 exports are and what our top 10 imports are. And the general rule of thumb here is that we're exporting here in Virginia a lot of raw products and then we're importing the finished goods. So um, I think the one that I like the most is like the logs and lumber and then it comes back as furniture, you know. Yes, sir. I've got a question that really relates to your last slide. Um, and that is when these <coughs> mega ships come online, how are you going to not only deal with the ships, but the land transport to get all that stuff out? Because our current transportation networks are totally circular. So. Right, right. So that is part of my job. And I should have explained it maybe earlier when uh, Bob introduced or said to introduce yourself, mm -hmm. but it is imperative. I can't even mm -hmm. explain to you how we cannot plan in a vacuum. And that I, uh, my role in government affairs is to work with our Hampton Road Transportation Planning Organization, work with our Secretary of Transportation. What we can do is provide, we anticipate these volumes, we anticipate these big cargo dumps with the larger ships and surges of cargo, and please help us ready. So I've spent, it's funny you mentioned this, I've spent the last two weeks writing federal grants to attract federal dollars for regional transportation projects, like widening 164 uh, that leads out to that massive Virginia International Gateway so that trucks have uh, more freedom to come and go and there's no bottlenecks there. Um, a grade separation in Suffolk is another project I'm working on. Um, working on some around the inland port. So these are all things that we have to monitor and have, um, I feel it's our responsibility as a state agency to go after some of these federal funding opportunities to bring those funds here to our region <coughs> to prepare our region for this sort of thing. So, so if you want to write letters of support for my grant, talk to me later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised not to see coal as an export. Uh, that's a really great, great point. So the Port of Virginia does not handle any coal products or really any energy or fuel with any significance. All of the coal that's handled in our waterways is done by uh, Norfolk Southern at Lambert's Point, and then CSX has a coal yard uh, with Kinder Morgan in Newport News. And your harbor is actually uh, the largest coal exportation harbor in all of the Western Hemisphere. More coal is moving out of these waterways. And that's significant when we talk about things like the depth of our harbor, because these coal ships are some of the heaviest ships in our, um, in our waterways. They have the deepest draft. And so if something is going to run aground due to some shoaling, it's likely um, one of those coal vessels. So I'm sure y'all see those out a lot on the water. Mm -hmm. But those that aren't really calling us. Again, we're more containerized cargo. And then in Newport News, we do uh, the bulk operation. Yes, sir. I was a crook of Suffolk in 2008. There was a big effort you know, to, make, to get the rail line into the Virginia mm -hmm. International. Yeah, Commonwealth Rail. Our, I, I, I can see how vital that is. With, is. Is anything being done uh, to expand that? or? That would seem to be one of the more ideal right. means of, of being able to handle what the large the supermax container ships. Right. Did everyone hear his question? He's referencing there's a, a median rail line that runs right into Virginia International Gateway. It runs in the median between Highway 64 and the Western Freeway. Um, and what was the big thing with that is they wanted dual stack capacity. And dual stack is really simple. You just stack two containers on top of each other. But it's crucial that you have that dual stack capacity throughout your entire network. Because one short little bridge or overpass or whatever can mess up the whole operation. Uh, Norfolk Southern, uh, there's two class one railroads in our region, Norfolk Southern and CSX. Norfolk Southern has dual stack capacity throughout their entire corridor. We call that the Heart Lane Corridor. So we can get from here to Chicago, Kansas City, uh, carrying two containers uh, for each car. CSX is very close to having dual stack capacity. They have it in probably two thirds of their network, but one key vein uh, that we needed to go up north and then west is not at dual stack um, capabilities quite yet. There's one tunnel in DC called the Virginia Avenue Tunnel that they're currently uh, constructing to, that's their last pinch point, and then their whole network will be too. So we're cheering them on. That will really help us capture uh, some, more, some more real volume as well. Yes, Eileen. Um, 
Meat and poultry, is that live or processed? Because I know around the world, lots of them want to be live. Yes, but they have found that those cows are awfully skinny by the time they make it to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're stressed. Okay, just a question. So, yeah. so that, that goes as to why the, the world likes a lot of what we're sending, because in concept, or in reality, it's, it, it's a better condition than what's happening in some other countries. Right. Okay. But we're also importing a lot of beef from South America right now. You know the big craze, like the grass-fed beef or whatever, uh, places like Argentina, and, and uh, they're developing those markets, and, and we as Americans are really into that right now. That's something, a, a trend that we've been seeing. Yes. How do you compete with a place like Newark and New York, where they have massive highways to get these containers out, and we have two lanes on 64. We're working on that. We've seen the construction. Um, I'll be dead by then. Man's <laughs> <laughs> Can I bring you with me, and we can go talk to people? Um, so so he, his question was, how do we compare to New York, New Jersey? They have this massive infrastructure. But what's really uh, key about New York, New Jersey is that they have 18 million consumers right there, and they primarily are serving those 18 million consumers right there. They do have some that's you know trickling by rail to Chicago. Um, some of the leftovers. <laughs> right, but they're they're pretty self-serving. Medical waste. And uh, yeah. so so really, yes, they probably do have amazing wonderful. Well, how do you think Popular Island created? They we gather in their trash. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Their trash is coming down here. That's right, that's right. Yes, Mr. Clinton. One of the advantages that we have over New York is uh, yep. there's a depth of We're all nice water. We're That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's a depth of all water. In New York, you're down to bedrock, so right. getting deeper is quite a production. Right. That requires so much federal uh, interaction as far as the EPA and, right. and all of those entities, and it's a difficult task. Right. right. So, the, and the, yeah, we'll talk more about Bayonne too, but um, so what they're saying is New York has its own obstacles as far as infrastructure. Maybe they have some better land side roadway infrastructure, but their depth is a problem as we talk about these massive ships that you spoke of. Um, and just a little, quick little anecdote is what, what Mr. Clinton is saying, they have these EPA regulations and things like that, so they have to blast this, this bedrock to deepen. Well, then they put it on a barge. That barge heads down to Houston where it's sprayed with this acid to kill all the caustic substance. And then they're paying to have it railed all the way to Utah and dumped somewhere in Utah. So when you're hiking in Utah and you think it's all beautiful, <laughs> just think about this. But that, but that process that I just described to you cost millions of dollars to do. And here in Virginia, we're very, very fortunate because we're on this like sandy, nice sediment. So when we dredge, one, it's far less um, time consuming, no blasting is required. But then we can harvest that dredge spoil material and repurpose it for something brand new. So that's one of the big advantages we do have over in New Jersey. Thanks so much for mentioning that. Tim. So these are um, a list of our top 10 export and import customers. This list vacillates, as you can imagine, throughout the year, but this is um, what it averaged out over the last six months um, of last year. And so um, do any of these surprise you? Yeah, Any Red names Bull. you probably recognize, of course, Walmart. Red Bull? This Red Bull is actually a funny story. I, I'm sorry I will stay on track, but um, Red Bull has a uh, distribution center near the Virginia Inland Port, so in northern Virginia. And uh, where does Red Bull say it's made? Does anyone know? It's, it's made in Europe, in Austria or Switzerland or something like that. Check it out on the can. Well, uh, the cans are actually made in North Carolina. <laughs> then they are shipped, exported through your port to Europe, where they're filled with that nasty green liquid. Sorry, if you like that stuff. <laughs> and then they're shipped back through the port of Virginia, up to the inland port, to their distribution center. So if you have had Red Bull here on the East Coast, it's likely come through the port twice. Yeah. All right, and this is um, always helps me. I think a picture is worth a thousand words. And so this is just showing you that, that the impact of the Port of Virginia is across the entire Commonwealth. There's not one corner of this 
this commonwealth that doesn't have some kind of manufacturing or distribution center that is pumping international trade, whether import or export, through the Port of Virginia. And um, Captain George and Mr. Clinton helped uh, the port this year as we went to Richmond and talked to legislators. We were seeking some funding for infrastructure here at your port. And uh, we got to see these legislators light bulbs turn on when we handed them a district profile and maybe this legislator is out here in Danville and they're like, oh, what, is, what does my district have to do with the port? But we listed all the, the shippers who are located in their district and there was literally not one house or senate district in the entire commonwealth that didn't have two or more shippers and then some sort of freight coming or going to their district. So it was good. They, they all understood the impact and how it is commonwealth-wide. And that impact translates into numbers. Uh, so we did a study uh, with the College of William and Mary, and they studied our economic impact. And so this is direct, indirect, and induced impact. And so uh, about 9% of the Virginia workforce can be attributable to the work that's done at your port. That equates to about $53 billion of, uh, of goods moving out of here. And what I like the best is about $10 billion of that is made right here in Virginia. So we're not just a pass-through. There, there is manufacturing and ag products that are that are coming straight from us. And this equates to almost 7% of our gross state product. So it, it's significant. And this is just a, a sampling. We measure um, economic development because we have a team specifically dedicated at the port to market to companies to expand or locate their business in Virginia. So these are companies that would be doing international trade and who would benefit from locating their business near a port. They can capture some efficiencies and, and save some money that way. And this is a sampling of some of the announcements who either expanded or located their businesses here last year. And then uh, if you look from 2011 to 2015, over 185 companies expanded or located here. That equated to about 35 million square feet, $6.5 million, billion dollars of investment. And then what do those legislators always like? The jobs. How many jobs does that bring? And this is, this is um, interesting because, you know, we talk about we've got to have jobs and it's real big right now with all the election talk and all that. But one of the trends that it's important for all of us to be aware of are, one, these jobs are good jobs because they're in manufacturing, they're in distribution, logistics. Um, but automation is a big, big movement in this industry. We want it safer. We're Americans. We want it faster, more efficient, cheaper. So these jobs, if I would have showed you these numbers 10 years ago, it would have been 40,000 jobs that came with this level of investment. We people are investing in Virginia, but due to automation, they're hiring 25 people instead of 50. And it's important to tell your kids and your grandkids to study that science, study that math, because driving a forklift, I just went to a distribution center, it's a Rubbermaid's distribution center, and, and they're a manufacturer. They were making the, the plastic bin and stuff that you see. Their forklifts were all robotic. There was not a single human in there stacking all of those boxes. It was robotic. So just keep that in mind. Encourage your kids. you you got to learn. It's, it's high-tech stuff. All that gaming is going to pay off with Nutella. <laughs> That's my soapbox. I'll get off the show. But this is, this is to, this, tell me your name. Uh, Kirk Boris. Kirk. Uh, Kirk's point earlier um, about the, the larger ships. So I just wanted to share with you some of the trends that we're seeing in shipping. Bigger is the kind of the name of the game right now. It, it's economies of scale. And if you are a ship line who can take one trip instead of three, you're gonna do it. These are costly voyages, and boy, howdy, do they charge you a massive toll to get through those canals. Uh, we think our tolls are bad. It's nothing compared to what these ship lines have to deal with. Um, but so the ship sizes are increasing. Um, we talked about the Bayonne Bridge in New York. Uh, they have to raise that thing. Uh, we're really blessed here. That's one of our natural advantages. Thank you, Navy. I know a lot of you are retired. Uh, Navy are still in it. And uh, we 
we have tunnels, much to the chagrin of the average commuter over here, but, but that is a real advantage when we're talking about commercial freight movement because these ships can get as big as they want and we don't have to raise any bridges because that's a billion dollar process that they're undergoing. And if you look at it, they're still allowing cars to drive over this bridge while they're doing this construction. It's, it's a real feat in engineering. Um, Panama Canal, What? tell me something you know about the Panama Canal. The new one's gonna open in June. New one's gonna open in June. When did they say this thing was gonna open? Two years ago. That's right, that's right. Um, so we, we think that it will open in June. This is uh, big news in our, our business because the Panama Canal currently accommodates a vessel that can carry about 5,500 containers. So those boxes that we've been talking about. Upon completion of the expansion, hopefully in June, uh, ships that can carry about 12,500 containers. It's excited. Yeah. <laughs> So, so upon the expansion, 12,500 uh, container vessels can fit through the Panama Canal. And that's a big deal for, for us. Um, but just to make you aware, Captain George and Mr. Clinton are routinely uh, escorting vessels into our harbor, uh, into our port, that are 9,000, 9,500 uh, container size vessels. So uh, where are these 9,000 vessels you know, containers, vessels coming from if they can't come through the Panama Canal. Suez Canal. <laughs> Suez Canal, great. So, Tim, you just hit that for me. This is just showing uh, the size and the evolution. And Bob, I can send you this presentation so you can send it out to people because I know some of these are kind of hard to read. But Tim, hit it one more time. Okay, here's the Panama Canal. That's the Bay Bridge, things we've been talking about one more time. That's where I wanted to go. So here we are, right uh, on the Mid-Atlantic, strategically located. You think, all right, uh, almost two-thirds of all of our, our trading is done uh, in Asia. So Panama Canal, 26 days. But actually, Suez Canal is very competitive with a 27-day transit time. Now, this, this graph, I never say this to anyone else, but it's a little misleading because no vessel ever just shoots straight from Asia here. They're making multiple stops along the way. But this is just to help you understand that in nautical miles, these routes aren't, aren't that different. It's really nominal in the grand scheme of things. So the Suez Canal has no depth or width restrictions. It can accommodate the larger, largest vessels on the waterways today. <laughs> What's that? It just has <coughs> Egyptian pilots. Yes, it does have from time to time some national security issues. We <laughs> <laughs> just finished widening the Suez Canal to allow two-way traffic for that. Yes. And they finished it three months early. Mm. Wow. wow. Yeah. Can they send those engineers down to Panama? <laughs> 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 um, so, so this is just showing you kind of, we, we are really nicely positioned here in Virginia to capture the movement of freight coming through both canals. All right, and so how do we prepare